How's it going, you guys? In this video, I'm going to be responding to a ridiculous claims by Dr. Milton Mills, uh, talking about how he thinks that human beings are herbivores. The most ironic thing about this interview is they're sitting there with giant bushes full of leafy greens that they're not even thinking about consuming, uh, probably because their body can't break down cellulose because it lacks a cellulose enzyme which right away already kind of debunks their entire argument. Humans don't have multiple stomachs like many herbivores. We don't spend the entire day grazing. I can go on and on, but let's let his uh, arguments debunk themselves. So many questions I wanted to ask him, starting with why he thinks we are herbivores by design. Look at the way human beings are actually constructed anatomically, and if you look at our physiology, we are truly strict herbivores. And that's why when we depart from uh, a strictly plant-based diet, we become ill. That's why thousands of people in these carnivore communities on Facebook, on Reddit, on YouTube, including myself and many of my clients have actually found the opposite, that the farther we move away from a plant-based diet and the more we base our diet on animal foods, the better off we feel, okay? Uh, many people have reversed autoimmune illness, uh, type 2 diabetes, even type 1 diabetes using animal-based diets. Uh, autoimmunity and digestive issues seem to be the most prominent uh, usage of um, animal-based diets. I had psoriasis. I had irritable bowel syndrome when I was vegan for an entire year. Veganism only made it worse. I, my asshole was a, sh a solid shooter. Furthermore, if humans are anatomically meant to eat plant-based diets, uh, why don't we see Dr. Milton Mills with his bloated ass face walking back there to that uh, nice leafy green bush that herbivorous animals would generally be snacking on, trying to eat that and uh, test the uh, lack of cellulase enzyme in his digestive tract because um, he can't convert the cellulose uh, in those plants for energy, let alone many of the vitamins, minerals, or uh, macronutrients contained in those plants. Humans can't really uh, absorb them or digest them very efficiently. Instead, this guy thinks that, uh, you know, going to the supermarket, spending $6 a pound on raw leafy greens like spinach and kale, you know, that have been hybridized so that human beings can actually kind of digest them. He thinks that that's the diet we need to be eating. He thinks that that's like a natural uh, hunter-gatherer, human, stone age, herbivorous diet. Please. Please go back there and eat those freaking bushes full of leafy green goodness, Mr. Or herbivore. Uh, diets that contain large amounts of animal food are associated with a number of chronic diseases. Correlation doesn't equal causation. Go back to school. Like heart disease, uh, uh, cancer, diabetes. This is actually, uh, we see the opposite correlation in Asian countries. Autoimmune diseases, high blood pressure, stroke. All based the on epidemiology. I actually have made videos and posts on my Instagram and my YouTube uh, sharing studies uh, that directly compare plant the plant-based Ornish diet to the animal-based high-sodium, high-fat uh, Atkins diet. And it's a clinical trial done over 12 months that actually shows significant uh, improvements in blood pressure, blood sugar, uh, hemoglobin A1C, fat loss, a wide variety of benefits from in the Atkins group, over uh, two to three times the benefit compared to the, the plant-based Ornish diet. And again, it has to do with the fact that we are really designed to eat a strictly plant-based diet. Again, uh, you lack the cellulase enzyme to digest those uh, that bush of leafy greens back there. The only reason why you're able to eat the plant-based diet you do right now is because of all the imported foods from halfway across the world at your supermarket that are so horrible for the environment. Yeah, yeah. And I guess for the people that... The abundance of plant foods that you get at a supermarket is not available in nature. You want to know how specifically we're designed anatomically to eat plants. You just have to look at our physiology, like jaw structure. The... Okay, just because someone flashes a graph like this in front of you doesn't mean that the information on it is entirely accurate. Guarantee you it was some kind of stay-at-home mom on a frugivore diet and government assistance that made this fucking bullshit. There's pl I'll actually have to make a separate video showing some other graphs that try to do make the same point with different information on it. The stomach acidity, the left bar uh, And we have the stomach acidity. Healthy humans have a stomach acidity of... Uh, 
hyena and scavenger animals. We don't need to have uh, canine teeth like a freaking tiger or whatever um, because we developed spears and stone tools Science, and like intelligent ways of trapping animals. People just say that might be true, but the only reason we're here today is because we ate meat back in the day and that's, we survived because of meat. What do you say to that? Uh, yeah, there, there are a number of uh, people who um, have advanced these theories and number one, none of the people uh, putting forth those theories are physicians. Okay, first of all, that's a blatant lie. Okay, we have Dr. Stephen Finney, uh, who is leading the research and has his own organization where he specializes in reversing chronic disease using ketogenic animal-based diets, Dr. Eric Westman, and then we even have Dr. Michael Eads. And I highly recommend you go and look up Dr. Michael Eads' uh, presentation, uh, Paleoanthropology and the Origin of the Paleo Diet. Uh, specifically the older, long, full version. I think it was from uh, before 2014 or something because his newer talks aren't really as great. Uh, go check that out. It was done by a physician who's been, uh, you know, working with patients on animal-based, high-protein, low-carb diets for decades, long before this bloated balloon ever freaking, um, you know, even came on the scene. Another thing, uh, besides the fact that there are hundreds of physicians who pioneer this theory and use it in clinical practice to help people improve their health. Uh, the fact is over 75% or more of anthropologists who do this shit for a living are absolutely certain that it was animal foods that made humans evolve. Okay. Um, and one reason why we can be so confident is carbon isotope tests that show the, you know, direct result of the amount of meat that we ate. Uh, most of them believe we're damn near carnivorous. And also, how the fuck did humans survive the Ice Age? Huh? And what about the, uh, the extinction of megafauna that scientists have correlated with the, you know, high meat diet of that time? And the carbon isotope tests that back that up. This guy is not a very science-minded person. And the reason I make that point is because if they understood what meat does to our health and to what does it do? They would never make that argument. First of all, there is no way that stone. Okay, the vast majority of physicians that advocate uh, animal based diets, and there are a lot of them. I don't know where this guy comes up with this idea that physicians don't uh, advocate this, uh, this uh, animal based evolution theory. Uh, all, all of the you know, there's a lot of freaking animal based doctors and low carb doctors and paleo doctors that specifically advocate this approach because of all of their patients that get better. I've had many clients that have gotten better. I myself have gotten better. Some age uh, humans could possibly hunt efficiently enough to uh, gather enough animal food to, to make that their primary means of gaining nutrition. Okay, so first of all, please tell me. How much nutrition you expect to find gathering berries, tubers, um, leafy greens that you can't even digest out in the wild? Um, how efficient is that? Okay, especially if you have a tribe of let's say a hundred humans, you know, even fifty humans. Okay, you go out there hunting and gathering. Okay, in the vast majority of natural environments, especially in the fucking ice age, please riddle me that or the savanna. Okay. You're not going to find a whole lot of freaking plant calories to sustain yourself, let alone the tribe, especially for weeks. Uh, compare that to something that this guy probably doesn't know because he doesn't seem to actually research uh, the reasoning behind animal based uh, uh, ideas and theories. The fact is indigenous humans, uh, there's plenty of books and research papers written about this. There's over 200 pounds or more. Uh, of usable flesh foods on uh, ruminant animals like buffalo and the Native Americans, okay? Native Americans used to kill these big ass buffalo, hundreds of pounds of a kill, and uh, they carry them around. They do basically weighted carrying exercise that we know is so good for our bone density and our health. Um, and they skin it and they eat as much of the buffalo as possible, including the colon and the fecal matter, you know, the probiotics, right? The fermented food in the in their um, uh, buffalo's intestine. 
You'd actually have colon eating contests, believe it or not. Um, and whatever food that they had left over, they would preserve. They'd make pemmican out of it, okay? Hunter-gatherer tribes and indigenous humans and paleoithic humans, uh, ancient humans, develop ways of preserving animal foods without refrigeration. Uh, but this guy clearly hasn't researched the very topic he's talking about, or else he'd know. Hundreds of pounds of flesh from one kill of an animal that we use stone tools and other things for spears and, uh, and intellectual traps versus, you know, a couple thousand calories that you get from the 40 berries or whatever you might find in a bush. Not to mention the fact that we know by studying these indigenous cultures, most of these, uh, these berries that are available out in nature are pretty toxic if you eat too many of them at one time, okay? And one more thing, he keeps saying we're herb herbivores. And he's even had interviews where he says human beings need to eat like gorillas. If we want to get big and strong like gorillas, he says gorillas don't, don't eat much protein. Their diet's mostly leaves and blah, blah, blah. So human beings should eat like a fucking gorilla to get big. One key thing this guy's missing is that gorillas can digest cellulose and humans cannot. And we're not fucking gorillas or cows. Anyway, uh, his arguments get way worse. Let's listen. Number one. Number two. Uh, people come up with theories saying, oh, well, okay, yeah, it's clear that humans couldn't hunt well enough to uh, um, uh, collect enough meat. Based on what evidence? Well. So human beings scavenge. Well, that's a ridiculous statement because it's clear that we do not have the physiology of a scavenger. I mean, every, at least in America, every Thanksgiving, people get sick from eating poorly cooked turkey. And that's a turkey. You hear that, you guys? Uh, human beings don't have the physiology of a scavenger because uh, thousands of Americans uh, at Thanksgiving get-togethers get sick eating poorly cooked turkey, according to him. Okay, let's dissect this dumbass argument. First of all, um, most people at Thanksgiving dinners don't just consume turkey. They stuff themselves with pie, with stuffing, with candied yams, sodas, beer, alcohol. Okay, not just turkey. And that's usually why we get this sleepy effect. It has nothing to do with tryptophan and fucking turkey. Uh, let's see. The second thing is that most average Americans are unhealthy and they have really bad uh, stomach acid robustness which, uh, you, you know, we need a high stomach acidity in order to destroy pathogens. Um, and the third thing is that uh, these turkeys are generally from factory farms, are extremely unsanitary, and in no way, shape, or form um, uh, represent the same type of nutrition or uh, sanitation risk or whatever, bacterial risk, uh, viral risk, parasite risk that you see out in nature. Uh, and I'm not advocating you eat like undercooked foods. I'm just saying this is fucking stupid. Turkey cooked in a you know thousand um, dollar um, stainless steel range that has temperature control. There's no An open fire can cook a turkey just fine. Thank you very much. No way people eating rotting flesh, you know, burned in some. They don't burn it. They don't cook it. Okay, there are. So many freaking carnivore YouTubers who eat raw flesh on camera and they're still alive despite all these socially conditioned morons out in the comments saying that they're going to die of bulletism and they're going to get a parasite and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's for the probiotics, basically. You know, you wonder where you get this uh, kimchi thing from, you know, and uh, freaking sauerkraut. Well, basically... Uh, when you eat this rotten meat, and by the way, I don't recommend eating the, the high liver or high meat is what they call it. Um, and there's a specific way of fermenting it. But uh, basically, it has like a like a mood boosting effect um, and uh, seems to exert certain uh, certain uh, effects on the on the physiology in the body. And we know that fermented uh, vegetables typically will also they have these supposed benefits and whatnot. What's the difference between eating rotten vegetables in the form of fermented like kimchi and whatnot, and then eating raw flesh, you know, rotting flesh. Now, again, I'm not telling people to do it. I'm just saying it, it seems from the real evidence of people actually eating these foods, these, you know, and hunter gatherers, uh, if you read the books and the research on them, there's plenty of societies that eat rotten freaking meat. Um, and they're just fine. They, they see it as a medicine or a, a delicacy. Um, 
but you don't have to eat that to be healthy. I'm just saying this is not an argument. Fire could possibly hope to sterilize that flesh well enough to prevent themselves from becoming ill. So we clearly are not scavengers. Furthermore, most um, large savannah predators don't leave enough uh, tissue on their kills to scavenge. Okay, so this guy sounds like he's never actually researched the, uh, the scavenger theory of human evolution. So, uh, first of all, what does, what exact, what papers, can you, can you show me what papers he's referencing? I don't think he's referencing any papers. Uh, and I doubt he's been out to the savannah to see these freaking animals. Maybe he's watched some National Geographic or something. Probably hasn't seen uh, all the videos on YouTube though of the, of different animals drinking milk out of the udders of other animals, but he does have a video where he claims that that doesn't happen. Stupid delusional fool. But, um, doesn't have any evidence that um, that this happens. The, the main thing is I want to know what does he think is edible tissue on a carcass? The reason why I know that he hasn't actually studied the uh, scavenger theory of human evolution is because the scavenger theory of evolution proposes that we would crack open the skulls of these kills that carnivorous animals would leave behind and eat the brains for the DHA and EPA content in which there are no EPA and DHA sources in the animal kingdom outside of some very rare and obscure examples like freaking algae. Please show me a, a, an indigenous human or a human living today that regu regularly would want to swim to the bottom of the ocean and collect algae in order to get their DHA. Or even, you know, how many humans actually lived along the freaking shoreline and collect algae. It just doesn't make any fucking sense. The point is, uh, our supposed need for DHA and EPA comes from, you know, this theory, this idea that we scavenge the brains, the skulls of carnivorous animal kills. We crack them open, eat the fucking brains and the bone marrow too, which is full of healthy fats, omega-3s and monounsaturated fats. Um, I don't think that he is thinking of cracking open bones and shit like that. He's thinking of like, I don't know, maybe just eating muscle meat or something. And also the, the liver and the intestine and some of these other things, um, or even the muscle tissue. There's some people that believe that the carnivorous animals uh, would leave behind, behind certain organs or certain parts of the animal besides the skull. So, but yeah, this, this guy hasn't, doesn't even know what this theory is. The carnivorous animals that he's talking about would leave behind the skulls and the freaking bone marrow. Period. And if there is food left, they guard those kills jealously and don't allow other animals, including humans, to actually come and try to scavenge from them. Um, I guarantee you that these animals are not going to be guarding the skull and bone marrow that they don't really bother trying to get to. And lastly, there, and what what references? Please show me the scientific reference. Really, Stupid. is no advantage in human beings eating lard amounts of protein. So first of all, what do you mean by large amounts of protein? Second of all, uh, amino acids are directly required for creating neurotransmitters in the brain. Things like even melatonin, which is also one of your body's main endogenous antioxidants because you don't need to get them from your diet. Um, serotonin, dopamine, uh, GABA, okay? And also things like glutathione, your body's master endogenous antioxidant is created from methionine and cysteine, which requires vitamin B12, which is only found in animal foods, uh, in order to convert into glutathione. So this high homocysteine that people talk about from animal foods and high methionine and all this bullshit, it's only a problem if you don't eat enough B12. And this guy doesn't supplement B12 because he's a moron. Uh, there is no uh, point to consuming huge amounts of protein because this is not healthy for us. Number There's one. actually studies now that have been coming out recently, and it's kind of controversial, that show a dose-dependent response in the amount of protein you eat, the amount of calories you burn, and muscle protein synthesis, seeing that the more protein you eat, uh, the more potential uh, performance gain and muscle gain you might get from protein. Now, I know that that sounds like bullshit, and it might be, but I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. I have found when I went from 120 grams a day of protein, eating a mostly plant-based diet, to, to doubling it to 200 to sometimes 300 uh, grams a day on a carnivore diet, not only did my sleep all of a sudden improve without any supplements, I was able to come off my chronic insomnia supplements, uh, my mood improved, my digestion improved because I quit eating carbs and plant foods, 
my sports performance improved. Everything fucking improved when I went from eating 120 grams, which is like double what this guy recommends. He says 60 a day, uh, up to 200 to 300 grams. Everything fucking improved. So, and I was vegan for for an entire year, which gave me, uh, which really made my psoriasis bad and my irritable bowel syndrome. And I was uh, at one point trying to supplement with extra protein to see if it would help, but it didn't. Uh, I felt so low on energy. I had chronic insomnia. I felt horrible. And it flared up my psoriasis and irritable bowel syndrome where I, my shithole was like a solid shooter. And uh, when I actually removed most plant foods and ate, and ate mostly meat and a little bit of fruit and some co cooked cruciferous vegetables, all those problems fucking went away. And I haven't had psoriasis or irritable bowel syndrome since then unless I eat uh, too much grains, beans, and legumes, or raw leafy greens. So fuck that. This argument's retarded. The human brain is mostly fatty tissue. It burns. Do you, does this guy really think that uh, when you eat animal meat, it only contains like freaking pure protein? Okay, no. Uh, probably anywhere from 60 to 80% of the calories you get from a steak is from fat. Okay? The fuck? Uh, pure glucose, which comes from carbohydrate, burns. Uh, pure glucose, which comes from carbohydrates. Uh, actually, if you go two to four weeks without eating glucose with, or without eating dietary carbohydrate, uh, your body starts to break down the free, uh, free fatty acids like adipose tissue and the glycerol backbone of triglycerides uh, to create uh, glucose and glycogen. And it can also convert pyruvate and lactate via the Cori cycle to provide uh, glucose demands. So this idea that you need to eat dietary carbs in order to fuel the brain is complete bullshit because uh, the body can produce glucose from fatty acids, okay? And it can also uh, burn ketones to some degree. So yeah, not really an argument. Protein is not the preferred energy source for our brain. Okay, first of all, uh, the body doesn't ever really burn uh, protein as an energy source. It can break down uh, amino acids from muscle tissue and maybe dietary protein, and it can convert amino acids like alanine into glucose, but it doesn't directly burn protein. It burns glucose, which can be created from amino acids, and it will only do that um, if there's a demand. So. Basically, gluconeogenesis is a man-driven process. And if you're eating adequate protein, okay, and you're depriving the body of, of glucose, like a low-carb or a keto diet, over time, your body starts to actually convert fatty acids first, glycerol from, from triglycerides and free fatty acids into glucose in order to do things like create tears, fuel the brain, fuel certain things like red blood cells and whatnot. Um, but it doesn't convert amino acids from protein unless uh, you're fasting for a long period of time and you're under eating protein. Then what it does is it breaks down your muscle tissue. But it won't ever start to break down protein of any kind unless it runs out of fatty acids. That's, so if you're like Eugenia Cooney or one of these uh, famous anorexic people, um, who publicize their, their disorder, then you're gonna to start to see muscle mass go downhill only after the body burns all of its body fat. So this is not entirely true. Like if you're calorically restricted, even if you're eating enough carbs a lot of times, you might see some muscle breakdown uh, some, some if you don't eat enough protein. But this mostly has to do with restricting protein and restricting calories or caloric energy. This has nothing to do with like what the brain needs and what it burns and blah, blah, blah. So eating huge amounts of protein is not helpful for us because our bodies can't store protein. So according to him, our, our, oh wait, what did he just say? And so any is not helpful for us because our bodies can't store protein. Oh really? Our, our bodies can't store protein. Right. Don't mind me. I'm just walking around with some boulders of amino acids on my arm and on my chest and all my traps and on my butt and my legs. Uh, yeah, this is not stored protein, you guys. The body's not storing protein. The meat that I eat, 
you know, that, that animal flesh. Yeah, those amino acids I get from, from animal protein, they don't come from stored amino acids in the animal's muscle tissue. Yeah, that makes no fucking sense. Clearly, that's sarcasm. Yeah, the body stores freaking amino acids and uh, protein just fine. That's what muscle tissue is, fool, which he has none. And so any protein that we take in over and above what we use on a daily basis, which is approximately, say, 50 to 60 grams of protein uh, on a given day, is converted into carbohydrate anyway. That is not true. I've already explained uh, uh, how gluconeogenesis works, which is what he just said. It's gluconeogenesis. Um, it doesn't just convert protein in a chocolate cake. It doesn't do that unless there's a demand. You have to be on the verge of dying of anorexia before the body will really start to kick that conversion into gear. And it mostly comes from muscle tissue, not dietary protein. Uh, as long as you're eating enough dietary carbohydrate, your body's not really going to be doing much with gluconeogenesis, especially if you're not deprived of calories. The second thing, the second thing is that, uh, when you are eating enough carbs and enough calories, the body doesn't just turn protein into chocolate cake, into glucose. Uh, generally what happens is it breaks down the larger peptides and the smaller peptides and then into amino acids, uh, which creates neurotransmitters and hormones and enzymes and muscle tissue. And then it can be converted into fat. But generally, there's such a high thermic effect of food from protein that, you know, you have to eat quite a bit of protein for it to uh, make a huge difference in fat gain. Anyway, this guy doesn't have, he doesn't study the physiology of protein at all with that stupid ass statement. Even vegans who advocate like these low protein diets, I mean, if they studied the physiology of protein metabolism, I'm pretty sure that they'd, they'd all call bullshit on this. The stupidest thing ever. And that process of converting that protein into carbohydrate is very energetically costly. It yep, yep. It has over double the thermic effect of food than other micronutrients. That is correct. That's why it's uh, beneficial for fat loss. Hydrates us. And uh, I'm pretty sure if I was type 2 diabetic and eating a surplus of carbs like you advocate, that uh, I'd be pissing out all that glucose and I would be dehydrated too but I don't really know of many scientific references that claims high protein intake dehydrates us. Therefore, it doesn't pay for us to try to eat huge amounts of protein. Okay, you're, you're claiming huge amounts of protein, he keeps saying. I'm gonna need numbers. Because it saps too much energy, uses up too much water. Ever since I've been eating adequate protein, which is at least one gram per pound of body weight, like everyone else recommends, um, I had way more energy. I had better sleep. I had better vitality, and all my clients have too. So, and I think this guy advocates like 60 grams of protein a day, which is terrible. I used to eat double that, and I'd feel like garbage. And does it get us any physiologic benefit? So really, like muscle gain, greater fat loss, uh, creation of of uh, neurotransmitters. Well, again, it doesn't make sense that yeah. humans would have wasted a lot of energy looking for protein that doesn't help us. And I, mean, I think it's a waste of energy to look for berries that aren't hybridized for our uh, physiology and they're mostly toxic if we eat too many and uh, they only have like a tiny amount of freaking caloric energy to be extracted to begin with and they definitely won't feed your tribe for a whole week. There's a, a, a researcher out of uh, UC Berkeley. But and how efficient is it to extract energy from those bushes behind you? You know, like a true herbivore would do? Go and eat those leaves and that grass, you fucking cow. The name of Catherine Milton who has this is that your sister? absurd theory that meat caused uh, humans to develop large brains. Number one, it's an illogical argument. Okay, so it must not be very absurd or illogical if it is a general consensus in the anthropology community. Uh, over 75% of anthropologists believe that animal foods, uh, you know, drove human evolution. Most of the scientific evidence is pretty convincing on this topic. Only a delusional B12 deficient vegan would say some dumb shit like this. It makes no, no sense whatsoever. Only if you haven't researched it. Line, there's nothing about All irrational. Me that in any way stimulates brain development. Neurotransmitter development, hormone development, B12, and if, DHA, EPA. In fact, you fucking cow. Eating meat or hunting stimulated brain development, then the carnivores would have the biggest brains of all animals. Ooh, or, and they don't. 
And which is why if you have a dog, he still drinks from the toilet. Okay, so humans are not carnivores because dogs shrink from the toilet. That is such a huge jump in fucking logic. The reason why carnivorous animals don't have giant brains is because they have claws and they have teeth and they're able to get by and survive just fine without creating those adaptations that humans had to create in order to survive the ice age and cause a massive extinction of megafauna and all the other things that have been documented um, that back up humans being, um, you know, meat based evolution creatures. Also, I'm pretty sure there's plenty of, um, you know, vegan animals or herbivorous animals. You bring them into your house, which is totally not their natural environment that they evolved into. Um, they're probably going to be doing a lot of weird shit too. Okay. If you ever, uh, go ahead and put a horse or a cow in your fucking living room and tell me it doesn't do some crazy shit. So yeah, I just don't see that as a logical argument. Considering all the crazy shit um, this guy has said so far and all the, you know, dissing other people's intelligence and stuff. Yeah, I would think that he would come up with better arguments than that. And there you have it, you guys. Dogs drink out of the toilet, therefore humans are not carnivores. According to Milton Mills, uh, carnivore animals are stupid and horses and cows and herbivorous animals are not stupid. And if you kept a pet herbivore in your apartment or in your house, apparently they would be very intelligent. They would hold intelligent conversations and they most certainly would not be drinking out of the toilet. Very intelligent man. I'm uh, completely just speechless at his intelligent, rational uh, arguments for why humans are herbivores. And I would love to ask him how come he didn't eat the grass in the background of this video, how come he didn't munch out on those leaves in the background, um, or maybe some tree bark like most gorillas and chimpanzees eat. But uh, yeah, maybe I'll uh, ask him some other time. Now yeah, and also there's plenty of other ridiculous videos he's made. He's made a video claiming that um, gorillas are big and muscular and all the biggest animals are herbivores and therefore humans should be herbivores too. Um, not taking into consideration that the majority of those uh, animals diets are tree bark and leaves and things that humans cannot digest. But uh, yeah, we'll make another video maybe later on. Uh, this is about all I really have the tolerance for at the moment. So let me know down in the comments section, uh, did that bush look delicious to you guys? Because I was salivating at the mouth this, through this entire interview and I was pretty damn distracted uh, by the leafy greens in the background that they weren't taking advantage of. Also, uh, what do you guys think down in the comments? Do you think Milton Mills has a point? What points do you think of his are valid? Do you think he's full of garbage? Um, and uh, do you think that humans are herbivores? Do you think we're frugivores? Do you think we're carnivores? Do you think we're omnivores? Thank you guys, subscribe for more awesome content like this, and I'll talk to you all next time.